Okay. So, let's now progress to think to the um, quantum stream. So, for a couple of you know, a couple of points, um, somebody was just pointing out. We looked. Uh, we finished up the the last lecture uh, by seeing the classical mass formula for a stringy particle. Of course. This is classical, and the amplitudes can take on any, uh, the oscillations can take on any, any values, and so there is a continuous mass spectrum in this case. So it would be nice to have a discrete mass spectrum to kind of respect the, the countable number of particles that we actually see. Of course, it's also the case that the world is quantum, so quantum mechanics, if this is going to be a viable theory, the world, you know, it's going to, we're going to have to look at a quantum um, formulation of it. So, what we're going to see is that quantum string theory is, a quant is quantum field theory. Um, and we're going to look at, quant uh, look at um, the string from a quantum field theory point of view in, the two, in two different ways. One is the uh, sort of particle um, picture of string of, of fields, and we'll also look at it from the path integral point of view, both of which are sort of important here. Uh, but you can see this, as we said, as I said, is a vector field living on the world sheet, satisfying a, a wave you know, a, a, a wave or field equation. Quantizing is going to make this into a quantum field, and that is the quantum mechanics of the string. So, I am assuming not everybody knows any you know, quantum field theory, so I'm going to start by giving a very short primer on quantum field theory for five or ten minutes, the basic <laughs> ideas that you need to know. And again, it's something that can be very complicated, but the basic idea is in fact very straightforward. So, You'll see this looks like the string, but I'm not talking about strings in the first, in the first place here. I'm just imagining um, a classical field living in a relativistic space-time. And put strings to one side for a minute. So, classically, we can Fourier transform, um, expand the classical field. So, phi is my classical field, and I've written a, a Fourier transform for it. Again, to sort of avoid the nasty uh, constants and um, complications, um, I'm just going to. Uh, oh, maybe I didn't keep it. I, I did. I think I did put it in a box here. Yeah, because I'm summing over modes. So here's just the Fourier transform. Uh, sorry, the Fourier expansion of the field into um, into uh, different modes. Assuming again that it there's a same kind of basic wave equation being set, relativistic wave equation being satisfied here. You can plug, just plug this formula into the wave equation and you find uh, this, uh, the following equation for each of the individual modes that they each satisfy uh, a simple harmonic oscillator equation. So, you know, Fourier expansion plus a wave equation tells you that a classical field is really composed of whole load of simple harmonic oscillators of different amplitudes. The amplitudes have to satisfy a, a simple harmonic oscillator equation, um, just a bunch of waves of different equation of, of different wavelengths. And I think that's all I have to say there. So that, once you have that picture of what a classical field is like, it's fairly straightforward to move on to a picture of what a quantum field is like, because you either uh, did a long time ago, or have done, or will do very soon, one of the classic quantum um, systems to consider is what happens when you um, quantize, uh, what, what is the quantum description of a simple harmonic oscillator? And there's a very neat and sort of important solution. So, you know, this is the, the dynamics for the classical simple harmonic oscillator. We see um, the oscillator amplitude 
uh, classically needs to be promoted to an operator. Uh, this complex conjugate then has to be promoted in quantum mechanics um, to its omission conjugate. So quantize in the normal way by make, taking classical objects and turning them into quantum ones and imposing a uh, commutation relation. Classically, these two, you know, alpha and alpha star commute. Um, in quantum mechanics, impose a, quanta, uh, uh, a, commu a commutation relation on the um, operators. If you look at this in a nice physical way, you'll think of the um, harmonic oscillators as actually having positions and momenta, and the um, alpha and alpha star will be a sort of an alternative representation of position and momenta, and you'll get the um, uh, commutation relations for alpha and alpha and its emission conjugate. Um, these will follow from the standard commutation relations for x and p. Um, we'll just quantize by imposing them here. And again, I'm setting h bar to 1 when I write this here. Standard quantization procedure, turn the classical objects into the, into the classical quantities into operators, impose quantum uh, comm commutation relations, and again, I'm imagining most of you, if not all of you, have seen this uh, at least once, and perhaps many, many times. Um, if you haven't, um, well, you probably will soon, and again, I recommend what I put up here, Suskin's lectures to explain how how this goes um, pretty straightforwardly. The system that you get is you will find that when you quantize this, the system that you get is that there's a, a set of um, uh, vector Hilbert space an in, with an um, infinite dimensional Hilbert space with a set of states, um, one labeled from zero, uh, one to labeled by uh, the natural numbers such that the action of the action of the, uh, the emission conjugate, the, the emission conjugate um, operator on any one of these states is to live, raise it to the next one with some normalization coefficient, or sorry, with some coefficient. The action of the, um, the other operator on any state is to lower it in this ladder, again with some constant, and it's actually, you can see that given these two conditions, the, um, they will have the, these two operators will have the correct commutation relations pretty straightforwardly, and it's also very easy, you can see immediately that if I act with the um, uh, lowering operator first and the, create, and the raising operator second on any state, what I get back is the label of the state M, um, and the state itself is unchanged. These states are eigenstates of um, this operator here, the A dagger A operator. Okay, so we'll talk about this as a raising operator for obvious reasons, this is a lowering operator, and this is the number operator that tells you which um, state that you're in. Okay, um, I'm getting, as I say, I'm guessing I've just told many of you things you know very well. But just to be on the board here. But of course, the thing is, if you have a single, this is the structure you get from a single simple harmonic oscillator, and the field is nothing but an infinite collection of, sim of simple harmonic oscillators, each one of which is going to have this kind of, is going to have this structure. So when, I, when, when, a, to, when a field is quantized, when you go from the classical state to a, from a classical description to a quantum description, you quantize each of the simple harmonic oscillators. And so a quantum state of the field will have to say for each mode, each individual um, simple harmonic oscillator, which each oscillator, what degree it's excited. So uh, the state is going to look like this. So the quantum state um, psi, I'm going to have to say for the n equals 1 um, simple mode, what degree of excitation it has, the n equal, for the um, n equals 2 um, uh, mode, what degree of excitation it has, and so on and so forth. And now, these things come in chunks. If you sort of think about it a little carefully, you'll see, in fact, each of these, cor each of um, uh, the modes corresponds to a, a free plane wave particle. 
So one can interpret this state as saying there are M1 uh, particles of the, low, of the um, lowest wavelength, there's M2 particles of the second lowest wavelength, and so on and so forth. Okay. So, however, this has a natural interpretation as something like um, uh, a state of many particles, but two things to kind of think about. In this state space, so imagine a state like this where I have some particular set of numbers written here which corresponds to a particular collection of particles. There's another state where there's a different distribution of particles. There's more of these and fewer of these and none of these and so on. Every kind of state like that is possible. And so this quantum system must um, allow, well, two things. One, transitions from one number of particles to another number of particles. So particles in this sense can be created and annihilated. Moreover, superpositions of different numbers of particles, a state of one, you know, a, a superposition of a state of one m, you know, where m1 is equal to one and m1 is equal to two. So there's a quantum indeterminacy, or however you want to think about superpositions in quantum mechanics, of how many particles there are and of what kinds. So I call them quantum particles, but that's really too strong when you move to um, quantum field theory. These aren't even like quantum particles because of this in this. Uh, variation in the number. They are, we'll just call them quanta, that have this property, that have this property. Okay, so that, I'm going to have to press the button. No, there we go. Okay. Come back to this in a minute. I think if you have sort of the five or ten minutes I just used to try and explain quantum field theory, this is the most useful thing to say and will certainly suffice for what we want in string theory because you can see we did indeed decompose the, the, the modes of the string in a similar way so that we had simple harmonic oscillator modes. So we are going to apply this idea to the string. I would say this is not, I think, the best way to think about quantum field theory. Um, it's much more natural to think about um, not to start with a, a classical field and to quantize that directly, but to think about what happens if you um, uh, try to come up with a, uh, you start with the existence of particles and a quantum description of those in special relativity, and you will see you are forced to develop the notion of a quantum field. Um, and this is the route that Steven Weinberg takes in his quantum field theory books, for instance. It's real, it's, it's, there's something funny about thinking about there being classical fields that get quantized. It's better to think that, look, if you, go, if you want interacting particles, quantum particles, you have to have fields too. And that's more or less demonstrable and demonstrated by Weinberg. Okay, so this is good pedagogically, but not necessarily the very best way in general to think about quantum field theory but fine for our purposes. So, as you said, we started, you, you start with a classical, if you're just in general with a classical field, decompose it, and what you find is it's, it's made of a, um, a collection of simple harmonic oscillators, and that, as you can see from our general classical solution, is also what happens in, to the string. Well, there's a position and um, center of mass motion term, but then we have a collection of oscillators, and these will quantize, I won't show you the details, but again, the commutation relations for um, x mu, this degree of freedom, and the string, and the string momentum will lead to um, the same kind of quantization picture for these, um, these uh, classical string amplitudes. They become uh, they simple harmonic oscillators, and, quantize in the same way, so that these will take on discrete and not continuous values, just as we had in this case. Okay, so that's why we apply these ideas of quantum field theory to um, the strings. Essentially, those simple harmonic oscillators, the amplitudes are no longer continuous, but come in chunks. 
but, but it's quantum mechanics, so superposable chunks as well. Okay. All right, so um, we now want to, remember we ended the first lecture by, with the classical um, formula for the mass of a stringy particle. <coughs> we want to uh, now use that formula, see what happens to the quantum string. That's the focus for the rest of the um, discussion. So, <coughs> I've written up here just the same formula, that we, that's the formula that I gave you before. Quantization means promoting these um, amplitudes, these classical amplitudes, to operators, which are going to satisfy um, harmonic oscillator commutation relations. So here we go. I wrote the um, just wrote the same formula to this point um, by uh, promoting these two operators uh, that will have a, a commutation, a, commu a non-trivial commutation relation between them. So, there's more going on here that we need to talk about. So far, so things look pretty good. This actually looks pretty nice for the mass formula. I have a sort of constant tension term out here. This you'll recognize as something that looks like the um, A dagger A number operator term. This looks like something that just counts the number of the excitation level of each of the n modes. So this sort of seems, should seem to be the kind of thing that you would like. You can, the mass is going to depend on counting how many, you know, what the excitation level of each of the modes is. The more it's excited, the more energy it is, the, the, the string has, so the greater the mass that it appears to have. Okay, but there's a few complications that need to be um, mentioned here. First, if you do the details, um, you find that the creation operators are not actually these alphas, but instead, The alpha ends don't quite obey the right commutation relations. You have to put it um, a factor of um, the square root of n. Ultimately, the commutation relations come from the commutation relations between this quantity and the canonical momentum of the string compared with this. And they lead, in fact, to the simple harmonic oscillator uh, commutation relations for this quantity um, a, not for alpha n. So the first thing that happens is if you want to write this in terms of a proper number operator, in which case you need um, these quantities here to be the, raising, the proper raising and lowering operators, you find you pick up a factor of n in this expression. But that seems physically reasonable. Again, the mass is depending on not just how each level is excited, but in fact the wavelength, the energy that's carried by each mode. So there should be Right? The greater n is, um, the shorter the wavelength, the greater the energy of the, um, of the mode. So really ought to, that factor really ought to be there, and indeed it is. Second, there's this quantity c that I put here. And the point here is, classically these two quantities commute. I've written them a particular way, but I could have written them the other way around. could have written alpha n dot alpha n star wouldn't make any difference classically, but because they don't commute quantum mechanically, I've made a choice about how to order these in the expression. And I don't know what's the, I don't a priori kind of know which is the right way to order these. So this is an ordering ambiguity that you, you get whenever there's a product, whenever you have a, you quantize a system and there's a product of quantities classically that commute, when you go to the quantum system, what's, if they don't commute, what's the correct order to write them down in the expression? Okay. <coughs> ordering problem, and this crops up in quantum field theory um, sort of all, all the time. 
However, I do know, you know, the commutation relations are just a, com the commuta commutator of a and a dagger is just one, or, or minus, minus one. So I know I can write things, write them down, I can choose to write them down with the lowering operator to the right and the raising operators to the left. And if I get it wrong, I'd have to swap some of them back around. But each time I swapped them, I, I, I reversed them, the commutation relation is only going to take up another a, a constant term. So I can com compensate for my ignorance of the right order by putting in a constant. And we're going to try and figure we're going to figure out what that constant is in a minute. Um, so this C just represents that I've chosen to write the operators this way, but that might not be the right way, physically speaking, to do it. That has to be compensated for. Okay, so we end up with this expression altogether with these things. Um, one other point I want to make. Uh, I, let, I put in that this is a dot product. Remember, when I did the expansion, these really have mu indices on them. These have space-time upper indices on them, these quantities. So from what I've said, there should be my space-time has d plus 1 dimensions, so mu can take on d plus 1 different values from 0 up to d. So this dot product is just the um, vector product of those two quantities, taken with the, with the Minkowski metric. So what it looks like is when I write something, when this is written, like what we have up here, for each value of n, it looks like there should be d plus 1 alphas involved, one for each value of mu, one for each space-time direction. And this is the other part of this, another significant part of the story that I am not going to be able to um, go into, but again, is always deal with, dealt with in the um, string theory textbooks. That's not quite right. There, in fact, are not d plus 1 independent simple harmonic oscillators for each value of n. There's only d because two of them don't count. But one of them, of course, one of the values of mu is 0 and is in a time direction. And if you put that in, you get negative probabilities. And there's a way of handling that to say that that one's unphysical. So that gets us down to d different simple harmonic oscillators for each value of n, for each of the spatial directions. And then, well, further analysis, the method of transforming into um, light cone coordinates, if you look at this further, will show you that even one of those spatial di di um, direction um, amplitudes is dependent on the others. So in fact, it looks like as I said, I've sort of suppressed the indices and this, it's all bundled up in this dot product for taking it. But it looks like there should be, uh, for each value of n, uh, d plus 1 of these a's, but in fact there's only d minus 1. And you just, um, I'm afraid, we'll have to take my word for that. Uh, because that is actually important. Okay, so let's think about the first excited, the first excited state, the lowest possible um, state we can have. The mass depends on <coughs> n, as we saw here. So the lowest excitation we can have will set n equal to one. Okay. So I'm going to have an excitation um, at the n equals one level. I'm just going to have a single excitation. I want this sort of number operator to be as low as possible. The lowest value it takes is, is 1 when I have a single excitation. So this is the form of the lowest possible... Um, um, excitation I can have. I act on the zero state to create one mode. Um, the I here indicates that I'm just going to pick one of the space, one of the independent space dimensions, one of those d minus one directions that I can excite in, okay? and I'm just going to have one of those. Okay, so I now plug in for the mass squared operator. Um, oh. I'm ignoring the. Uh, 
let's see. That I, so I'm going to let I'm, I'm going to say it's the um, mu equals one, the x direction that's not uh, that's uh, dependent on the others. So I only have to think about the two through d spatial direction dimensions. I just here expanded out this dot product in the direct in the using the uh, uh, excitation directions that are relevant. I've left c in here. If I act on the vacuum with this operator, using the notation from the previous slide, I'm in the n equals 1 uh, mode, and I've got some particular direction, and the excitation level is 1. So basically, you pick one spatial direction other than x and create one single excitation. These things are the number operators we saw before. These are going to be zero for most quantities, for, um, for most of the um, values of i, but for one of them, I'm going to get one excitation. Okay, straightforwardly, n is one, and then the other thing is just a number operator, so I have a single excitation. What I see is, okay, I get to this. We'll come to the zero in just a second. Okay. That's just the application of my operator to the quantum state that I have. Um, I see that the mass squared has to be the tension times 1 minus c, where c is that ordering constant. As I said, there's d minus 1 such states. So the lowest mass kind of particle I can have then has d minus 1 possible different states. If I excite in any of the other d minus 1 directions, I get the same mass. And so those look like further internal states of the system. Those d minus 1 directions of excitation correspond to d minus 1 internal degrees of freedom of this lowest mass part, or this, this first excited particle. They all have the same mass, but there's something different about them. Well, in quantum mechanics, the internal degree of freedom that you have is spin, or polarization, it's spin. So what we're talking about here is one kind, is a kind of particle, okay, they all have whatever internal state it's in, it has the same mass, this quantity here, but we know it only has d minus 1 internal states. It's a particle that lives in d plus 1 space-time dimensions, but only has d possible spins, sorry, uh, d minus 1 possible spins. That makes it, relativistically, a massless particle, a massless spin 1 particle. Why is that? If a particle has mass, but, all right, so it's massless particles can only have transverse spin. They, their, their spin has to be um, perpendicular to the direction of motion. And there's a sort of intuitive way of thinking about that. If a particle um, has mass, you can perform a boost to make it, um, to bring it to rest, and then perform another, so imagine it's moving along at some velocity with spin in some direction. I can pick another frame in which it's not moving at all, it's still got that spin, and then transform to a second frame in which the um, spin is in the direction of motion. If it's massless, you can't bring it to, you can't perform that operation and make it so that its spin is in the direction of motion. The only possibility is that the spin is transverse to the motion. That's what we have here. So massless particles in a d plus one dimensional um, Minkowski spacetime. Uh, let me start that sentence again. Uh, um, yeah, no, I think I said it right. Massless particles in a d plus one dimensional Minkowski spacetime have, um, if they, sorry, if they have spin one, um, can only have d minus one uh, uh, different spin directions because their spin has to be transverse. So, if you're given a particle and you're told that it's spin one and it only has d minus one different spin states. You know they have to be the transverse ones. You know that it has to be a massless particle. So we just worked out the formula to see what the mass was. 
because of the spin states, we know this must have, in fact, first excited state must have mass zero. And so, to make that the case, we know C must, in fact, be, must be one. That will lead to um, the right outcome. So Lorentz invariance, which is what is telling us that this is a massless particle because of its spin states, that tells us that C equals one. That's the good news that it helps us do that, to be physical. The bad news is, this is the first excited state. There's a lower excited state, the vacuum, which must have less mass than this. And so this must be a tachyon that has a, a, a negative mass squared. So this makes the theory that's developed up to this point um, unphysical. We'll come back to that in just a, a second. The problem with the tachyon, not necessarily that it moves faster than light, but it's energetically unstable. This system can um, just decay arbitrarily. The same ideas apply to the closed string. As, this, as we saw classically, there are left and right moving um, modes. So, the left modes behave like an open string. The closed, the, the right modes move like an uh, like an, another open string. You can see that, that they have to satisfy level matching. The result that you get from uh, counting the number of modes using this the operator that we have here. Sorry, has to. So for the closed string, you'll have a term like this for the left moving modes, and another term like this for the right moving modes, and it's just a mathematical property of the closed strings that those have to give the same value. So the least I can do is, so the lowest <coughs> state now is not just, you might think, would be to just say excite one left moving mode or one right moving mode. That's not a possible state. The lowest state you can have is one left moving mode plus one right moving mode. And so the first excited states, there's going to be d minus 1 um, squared states. Same reasoning as, the same reasons as before. The left moving has d minus 1 states, right moving has d minus 1 states. So the total number is d minus 1 squared states. And analysis will decompose these into not just one kind of particle with d minus 1 um, internal states, but actually three different particles. So one that has no indices, no spin, a scalar particle. You get a magnetic-like particle with two indexes, something like a B field. And this is the beautiful part. You also get um, a, 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 another, uh, for the same reason these are massless, massless um, spin two particle. And that's exactly what a graviton, the quantum of a gravitational field, is supposed to be. So what we are seeing, and now starting to sort of look ahead, is the string, the different modes of the string, gives us an account of stringy particles. Um, for the case we've been looking at, something that looks like a photon something that looks like a massless scalar, something that looks like a magnetic field, and something that looks like a gravitation, the quantum of a gravitational field. And, well, if it's a quantum of a gravitational field, it's something like you combine these to make a quantum quantized metric. From a string theory point of view, at least at this level, the nature of matter and quantum geometry is exactly the same. They're just different states of the string. I mean, we need to talk in more detail about the significance of this. But there's an ontological unification here between the quanta of matter fields and the quanta of the gravitational field. So these are just different, you know, again, stringy particles, stringy quanta. The gravitational field is ultimately made of lots of little strings so small that you can't, that they look like particles in the right mode. But at another time, that string might have transitioned into a mode where it appeared to be a, a quantum of uh, 
a, a matter field, of the magnetic, of a magnetic field, of a scalar field, or the light field. Okay, but that's to look ahead. But what we've seen at this point then is the route from classical string theory through quantum string theory to the stringy um, quantum, to these different kinds of particles, or ultimately they, they're going to make up, appear to make up quantum fields. Okay, we have all the particles, and right, ultimately they're going to be interpreted as say, stringy particles, or rather stringy quanta of quantum fields. There's something, the matter that we know of, you know, the, the, what we usually think of as matter, so electrons and quarks, are not, um, don't actually look like simple harmonic oscillators in this, in this way. Um, a simple harmonic oscillator, so if you have a simple harmonic oscillator, you take the vacuum and you keep hitting it with the raising operator. Okay. If you think about that from the quantum field theory point of view, you're just describing more and more particles that are exactly the same. They're all particles, uh, quanta particles, um, but the same, the, uh, the free particles of the same momentum. That means they're bosons. They don't satisfy the Fermi exclusion principle. I can make as many of the, one, of the same ones as I like in that way. I describe as many as I like in that way. So the theory that's been developed, that we've described so far, doesn't explain the existence, doesn't explain the Fermi exclusion principle, and so cannot account for the existence of um, what we think of as matter particles, especially electrons and quarks. So something similar would need, needs to be done, and indeed can be done, where in addition to these um, bosonic modes, one also adds um, something like fermionic modes. One has a different, not commutation relations, but in fact anti-commutation relations for some other fields. When one does that, one finds then added to the spectrum fermions, as one would like, one also finds a symmetry called supersymmetry. One also finds that there's no, the tachyon is removed from this system, so this is actually a consistent um, system. So when one talks about string theory and superstring theory as a sort of viable physical theory, it's really the extension of what we've talked about here to fermionic excitations that people are thinking about. I mean, it's also the case that we only need um, 10 space-time dimensions in this theory, um, which you might think is an improvement over 20, the 26 that you need in the other case, but still <coughs> clearly too, too many. <coughs> okay. And I think, I think that's it for today. Um, Tomorrow, we're going to talk about um, dualities in string theory, which is a particular kind of very strong um, symmetry of a rather surprising kind, which will put on, which, according to which, the space-time in which the strings live, for instance, does not have a particular topology, or it does not have a particular size, and so there's a sense in which the, string, the space in which the strings are living is quite different from the space that we see and perhaps should not be thought of as the same space that we live in. Okay, but that's um, for tomorrow. We'll talk about, we'll develop those ideas and talk about their significance. But um, thank you. If you have questions, I'm happy to, to take them.
how people came with the idea of quantizing the string. Considering a string in relativistic theory and then quantizing it, I, I don't think that's very intuitive and it's not something that we like, do. So why quantize a string? And right. Um, well, as far as the quantizing go, yeah, okay. I mean, like, the main question is why is string not something else? So let me. Give, I'll give the historical answer. Somebody, somebody else asked me this during during the break. Um, I mean, one of the quick answers is well, once you think there are strings that are classical, you should quantize everything. So that, that's natural. But why do we? That's not really a good answer, historical answer. The reason, the way people got interested in strings originally back in the 1960s was when they were under, interested in. Um, uh, understanding scattering processes involving the strong interaction. And there were certain mysteries involved in looking at uh, what was what the different the processes that were involved. And in particular, well, there's a couple of things that people will mention in this regard. Come over here. I think I'm getting the right pictures. They were looking at processes and yeah. These I think this is the right one. These two kind of processes. If it's not these, I okay, and there's some other pictures. And they're different. They're, these are different from the point of view of uh, particle physics and these kind of Feynman diagrams, these are two different contributions to a, to a scattering process. But they turn out to have um, the same amplitude, they contribute to the same amplitudes. And so there's something the same about them that you can't see by looking at the particle picture, because topologically these are different. And, but if you think, and this is the story, that Really, both of what's going on is that there are the strong interacting particles are, are strings. These are just both topologically, if you try to sort of make these two-dimensional, you end up with the same two-dimensional topology in both cases. And so you can understand why these have the same amplitude, because they're the same stringy process. So that was one of the reasons people were interested. And of course, this is quantum theory, so you wouldn't just stop at it classical theory. Um, so that's, anyway, that's the sort of official history of why people started thinking about string theory. It was in connection with the strong understanding, the strong interaction. Um, and then, uh, well, then they figured out QCD and became less interested in this, but there was a lot of math had been developed. And in working on this, they had realized, you know, they knew these facts, and in particular the existence of the massless spin two particles. And those people who carried on working on string theory eventually sort of realized the significance that this isn't a theory of strong interaction, it's a theory of gravity. Does that make sense? That, I mean, that's the motivation that I think people had. Uh, we have to Leave. stop now because there's class. Ah, okay. So, so uh, see you tomorrow then. Thank you. Okay, thanks for coming. <laughs>